No other place does an issue come up and Jesus tells three stories. This, this tells us that on this particular issue, he, not that he doesn't mean business in other places, but he really means business here in Luke 15. So we're going to look at the first two stories, and then you're going to see the third story acted out for us, which is appropriate since it's a parable. It's a story, so we'll see the story as a story. Before we get into Luke 15, though, let's pray, and, and we're going to start in Psalms. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the time that we have this morning. We ask that you would open our hearts to familiar stories and let the power of the words of your Son speak to us. Um, we never outgrow needing to hear the words of Jesus, needing to listen to the prompting of your Spirit, needing to submit our lives to you. Father, we ask that you would help us to listen this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So the longest psalm is which number? Yeah, 119. It's, it's pretty long, 176 verses. It's pages long, you know? It's like, oh, there's one page and another. There's, oh, another page, okay, and oh, another page. All right, oh, well, wow, another page. It's long. It starts like this. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong but walk in his ways. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. I will praise you with an upright heart. When I learn your righteous rules, I will keep your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. I find those verses very discouraging. They're very discouraging. Blessed are those whose way is blameless. Does that describe any of you? So what does that mean? Well, I guess I'm not blessed. <laughs> um, blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart. How often do you seek God with your whole heart? Who also do no wrong. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that I, my ways might be steadfast in keeping your statutes, then I will not be put to shame. If only I can keep all the commandments, then I won't be ashamed. You feel encouraged yet? I will praise you with an upright heart. I will keep all of your statutes. Don't forsake me. It's not really very encouraging, is it? If I'm blameless, if I pay attention to every commandment, if I keep them all diligently, if I love God with my whole heart, then I won't be ashamed and God won't forsake me. Well, who does that describe in this room? I can, yeah, there's no suspense. Not one of you, okay? <laughs> it doesn't describe one of you. It doesn't describe me. So, that's the question today. How does God feel about me when I wander away? How does God feel about those who are far from him? Are there a few people in our community that are far away from God? How does God feel about them? What can I do so that God will love me? I mean, reading Psalm 119, and this is just the first eight verses. It goes on a long ways. What do I do to get God to love me and not give up on me? Because if that's what I have to do, be blameless, do no wrong, keep God's commandments with my whole heart, diligently, that's not me. Well, if you look through all the way to the end, by the way, this psalm has some, you know, very familiar things in it, right? How can a young man keep his way pure? Well, how does a young man do that? The Word of God. Yeah. And the word is, is, you know, when I'm out in a dark place, the word of God is what? It's a light to my feet. 
But what's interesting, what I want to point out, is how this psalm ends. So this is the ending. Verse 176. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. That's the end of this psalm. I have wandered off like a lost sheep. Seek me. Seek your servant. Find me. Bring me back. That's the end. The thing about God's word is that you have to read all of it, the whole thing, to understand what is being said. If you were to read just the first eight verses, you would look at it and you, could, you would say, well, I can't do that. I haven't done that. So God will give up on me. He will forsake me. And I can't praise him. I don't have an upright heart all the time. This, this must not be for me. But that's because you didn't make it to verse 176 where it says, I am like a lamb who wanders off. I really need you to find me. And, of course, that's also not the end, because that's only one psalm. And today, we're going to be in Luke 15. And like Matt mentioned, we have the the Acts books out there. I encourage you to, uh, you don't have to have this, but, you know, with these kind of things, you can can highlight, make notes, and all sorts of things. And God's Word can reach your heart in a way maybe it hasn't. Luke 15. Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all drawing near to Jesus, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Now the first thing to point out is just the really simple thing that's happening in this sentence, right? There's a contrast here. Who is drawing near to Jesus? The sinners. And who is grumbling? Yeah, the religious leaders. That sets the scene for the whole... To understand why the stories are being told, you have to understand that sentence. The people who are drawn to Jesus are the ones whose lives are not, they don't have their act together. Their life is full of sin. They feel far away from God. They, no one would ever pick them to be, you know, a leader in Awana. Okay, this is, these are the people who are drawing close to Jesus. And who is really far away from Jesus and they're just complaining the people who read God's word, who pray regularly, and who are leaders in the church, far away from Jesus. Unless you understand that contrast, you will not understand any of the stuff that follows. And this is what makes this passage of Scripture so difficult, is that we often refuse to accept that first sentence. We, we refuse it. We don't think we do, but we do. We refuse that first sentence. It's like we think We want Jesus to welcome sinners, but often we don't really mean it, either for ourselves or other people. And as we go through here, I I pray that your eyes would be opened by the words of Jesus, is that oftentimes we as people, we accept the ministry of Jesus just not in our heart, and we accept the ministry of Jesus just not in our church. If he wants to do that, he can do it down at the pizza place, but not here. And so, we'll start with story one. So, Jesus told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. How many of you have heard that story before? (laughs) Okay. It's one of the most famous stories ever told. And Jesus is being criticized for hanging out with people who are sinners. And so he tells this story. And he says, you know what God's heart is on this for those who are far away from him? God's heart rejoices when someone turns to him. As a matter of fact, Like a shepherd, he goes out and looks for the one who is lost. That's God's heart on this issue of those who are far away and who have wandered off. Like the last verse in Psalm 119, the person who is not blameless, who is not diligent about keeping the law, who does not praise God with an upright heart, how does God feel about that person? He seeks them so that he might bring them back on his shoulders rejoicing. That's God's heart 
on this issue. And notice what he says. There's more, far more rejoicing in heaven over the one who was lost than the 99 who had no need of repentance. Now, this is interesting to follow because percentage-wise, how many people are lost in this story? One percent are lost in this story. Got to track that. And we come to the next story. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I have lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So that the scene changes. With the sheep, they're out in the open field, right? You've got to go out in the open field sometime. At some point, you have to go to school, go to, maybe go to college or get a job, got to do your shopping, purchase gas, get to know your neighbors. You have to go out into the open field. And you go out there and you find that, you know, you can get lost or there's someone lost around you. That can happen. Well, this is a different setting. Where is this one taking place, the woman with the coins? It's in the house. And here's the thing we don't understand sometimes is that people can be lost in the house, right here, in this house of worship, people can be lost. And, you know, a funny thing, this sermon series is called Seek and Save the Lost because Jesus said that he, the Son of Man, came to seek and save the lost. And I just know that some of us, when we heard that sermon title, thought, well, that's nice. We're going to spend a half a year talking about seeking and saving the lost, so I guess we should do that for those people those people who are lost, but I'm looking forward to when we get around to talking about issues that have something to do with me. You laugh. <laughs> but the, this is an easy thing to do as a believer. I'm not lost. I believe in Jesus. What, you think only unbelievers can wander away? You think only unbelievers can ignore God's commands or sin or be far from God? Really? People can be lost right here in the house, and they can be sitting right next to you. And there's different ways to be lost. One way to be lost is that you feel that you will never be good enough for God to really love you. I call that lost. You may have put your faith in Jesus, and your sins might be forgiven by his blood. You might have eternal life. So maybe not lost in that sense but you are totally unaware of how much God loves you. And you live your life as if God is always displeased with you. You will never measure up. He has no interest in you. He has forsaken you. You're lost. Here you are in the house of worship, and you don't really know your Father's heart. Not really. Well, what's the percentage of people who are lost in this story? 10% of the people are lost. And you may feel like, okay, that's getting more accurate. You know, maybe in the church, 10% of us are, you know, lost. And the other 90%, we have our act together. Remember, Jesus' point is that heaven rejoices, is more happy over the, the one person who needs to repent and comes back to him than the ones who don't need to repent. And you may be thinking, well, Jesus is saying most people don't need to repent. That is not what he's saying. <laughs> he's getting our attention by the storytelling that he's doing. So, these are the first two stories. And remember the setting. You have people drawing near to Jesus whose lives are in disarray. And the people who are grumbling about that are the ones who read the word, they pray regularly, and they're leaders in the church. This prepares us for the, the play that we're about to see. And I want to point out one thing before you see this play, is that Psalm 119 said, the, the psalmist says, I know your commands and I pursue them diligently. <clears throat> what was the woman looking for diligently? The lost coin. In the faraway town of Tumbleweed, there is a beautiful cattle ranch by the name of Holy Cow Hideaway. The owner of the ranch was named Bovine Bill, and he had two sons, John and Wayne. Now Bovine Bill was a caring and compassionate man, and he loved his boys more than anything in the whole world. He tried his best to teach them to be hardworking and kind, and he succeeded. 
At least with John he did. Wayne was a different story. Did a mighty fine job today, son. Just look at all those cattle. Someday this will all belong to you and Wayne. Speaking of your brother, have you seen him? I asked him to round up those cattle that got loose last night, and I haven't seen him since. I haven't either, but he probably didn't do it. You know how he is. I gotta admit, I reckon I ain't seen everyone work so hard to get out of work. <laughs> well, let's take a look around, see if we can find him. He really needs to start pulling his weight around here. There he is. Wayne, wake up, son. Oh. oh. Pa, what's going on? Well, I was about to ask you the same question. Did you, what are you doing taking a nap? Did you round up those cattle like I asked you to? What? Oh, yeah. Well, I was going to, honest, but I just was real tired, and I thought I'd take a quick nap first. I was out pretty late last night with my friends, and I was pretty tired. I'm sorry, Pa. It's always something with you. When do you grow up and start pulling your weight around here? Get off my face, darling. You ain't my boss. All right. All right, break it up. Now, cut it out, guys. John, why don't you on going out of the house? You and your brother and I, we need to have a talk. All right, Paul. Wayne, we need to have a little heart to heart. Come sit over here a spell. Now, Paul, let me just say, I think you expect too much from me. I try my best, but I can only do so much. I'm still young and I ought to be able to have some fun. I can't be expected to work all the time. And I'm sorry I fell asleep, but I want to make sure we're on the same page. I ain't able to work no more than I already do. Well, son, I don't think we're on the same page. <laughs> Heck, I don't even think we're reading the same book. <laughs> you are young, but that's no excuse for your behavior. I need your help. This place is going to belong to you and your brother, and I need you to know how to take care of it. You're a man now, and I need you to be responsible. I need to know you're going to be responsible and to help your brother. You can't keep slacking off. I just won't allow it. You won't allow it? Well, like you said, I'm a man now, so maybe I don't need to stay here on the holy cow hideaway. Well, what, what do you mean? Well, half this ranch is going to be mine, right? Right. Well, why should I have to wait for my share? I'm never going to be a very good rancher. Besides, I'm not interested, and John would love to have this place all to himself. I don't exactly get along. Wait, it's, it's... Pa, I've made a decision. I would like my half the ranch right now, in cash. I'll take the money, and I'll start a life for myself somewhere else. I'm through taking orders and being expected to work like a slave. Is that what you really want? To leave? Yes, I'm sure. All right. All right, well, we can't continue on the way things have been. If that's truly what you want, I'll get your inheritance now, and you'll be free to do as you choose. Really? Yahoo! Well, thanks, Pa. I'm going to go pack right now. Bova and Bill was heartbroken that his youngest son was leaving, but he knew that Wayne was determined to go, so he retrieved his half of the inheritance and went to say goodbye. Here you go, Wayne. Here's your inheritance. Thanks, Pa. Well, I guess I'll see you both later. Wayne? Yeah? You sure this is what you really want? I'm sure. Well, just know that I love you. And you can come back anytime, you understand? Okay, Pa. Can you believe that guy? All I can say is good riddance. He's made some bad decisions, but remember, he's your brother. He's family. Never give up on family. Wayne was ecstatic to be on his own. He was finally free to do whatever he wanted. Well, Wayne, you can do anything you want. You've got a load of cash burning hole in your pocket. <laughs> now what am I gonna do with all this money? Did, now, did somebody save money? <laughs> well, hey there, fella. What's your name? Oh, uh, Wayne. Oh, well, nice to meet you, Wayne. Name's Shifty Pete. I'm making my way to the, uh, the saloon to have some real fun. You wanna, you wanna join me? 
Uh, well, I don't know. All right, well, suit yourself. You know, the saloon's a place for real men to go have some fun, but, you know, you look too young, and we'll, we'll see you later, Woody. Wait, hold on a minute. I'm not a kid. I know how to have a good time. I'll come along. All righty, well, I'll teach you how to play some poker. I may have, may have lost my shoes in the last game, but, you know, <laughs> how's that? Wayne was easily influenced by his new friend, Shifty Pete, and he soon drank and gambled his entire inheritance away. He was broke, so he reached out to his friends for help. Come on, Shifty, you gotta help me. Uh, the Jameson brothers really creamed me in that last game, and they ain't too keen on me not having the money. Uh, just lend me the money, and I'll promise I'll pay you back. No can do, Wayne. If you didn't have the money, you should have kept playing. This, this is your deal. I, I ain't getting involved. But I thought you were my friend. Sure, we had a few laughs, but I, 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 you can't expect me to stick my neck out for you. Wayne, look me up when, you, when your daddy gives you some more money, all right? We'll, we'll have some more fun. <laughs> I can't believe that guy. What am I going to do? Uh, excuse me, ma'am. Uh, yeah? That, that sign you just put up. <laughs> well, uh, uh, what kind of help you be needing? I find myself in powerful need of a job. Well, my name's Patty Porker, and I own a pig farm outside of town. <laughs> <laughs> and I need some help feeding my pigs. Are you interested? Pigs? Feeding pigs? Uh, no, not really. Somebody else. Wait, bring that in right now. You me up on it, boy. Oh, wait. Uh, okay, uh, fine. I'll, I'll take the job. Are you sure now? I need somebody reliable, and I won't tolerate any laziness. Yes, ma'am. All right, come with me. We'll try it out. Patty Porker was no easy woman to work for. She loved her pigs and had very high expectations for their care. So for the first time in his life, Wayne worked, and he worked hard. But no matter how much Patty required of him, he knew that he had no choice but to stay and do what he was told. Wayne ended up having to give all of his wages to the James brothers to pay off his gambling debts. This left him without any money for himself. He was starving and exhausted. Hey there, Anki. <laughs> You want to share some of that food? No. Swine. <laughs> I can't believe I'm so hungry. I'm actually envious of pig slop. I've never been so hungry. Even the ranch hands at Holy Cow Hideaway have it better than I do. Wait a second. That's it! I know Pa will never forgive me for what I did, but maybe he'll at least let me be a ranch hand. I'll work real hard, and at least I'll know I have food and be treated well. I have to at least go ask. I mean, Paul's always been so kind and loving, and always doing the right thing, and I just abandoned him. I threw away any chance of being his son, but maybe he'll at least let me work for him. I have to try. Hey, what are you doing? Get back to work! Uh, I quit. What? I quit. Go on, fine. And you lasted longer than the last guy. Sorry. Uh, thank you. See you later. Oinky, good help is sure harder. <laughs> <laughs> so Wayne started the long journey back home. The closer he got, the more scared he became. He kept on rehearsing what he would say to his father. How could he ever make up for how he had treated him? He was terrified of the thought of his father's rejection. It sure is a hot one today. I wonder the... What in the world? Wayne? It is Wayne, my son. My son's come home. My boy, my boy, I missed you. Uh, pa, I'm really sorry for the way I acted. I was immature and ungrateful. I was lazy and disrespectful. I didn't realize how good I had it here with you. I know I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, but would you at least let me come? Would you at least consider letting me be a ranch hand? I'd work real hard, honest. Would you please forgive me? My son, I will always forgive you, no matter what. 
I love you so much, and I'm so glad you've come home. And none of this nonsense about you being a ranch hand. You're my son, and you always will be. Love you, Pa. I love you too, son. Uh, John. Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> You're back. That's right. Your brother's come back home to us. He's apologized, and we've worked everything out. Hey, you know what we ought to do? We ought to have a big party to celebrate your homecoming. What? Yeah, yeah. We'll all invite all our friends and family. We'll have a big old barbecue. There'll be music and dancing. It'll be great. Pa, that's real nice, but you don't need to do all that for me. Fiddlesticks. I know I don't need to. I want to. This will be the biggest shindig tumbleweed's ever seen. Pa, can I have a word with you in private? Well, sure, son. Oh, Wayne, why don't you go down to the house and clean up? We'll be there in a minute. Okay, Pa. What's on your mind? I can't believe you forgave him. And just like that. And on top of all of it, oh, you're gonna throw him a party. Now, I have been here for you. I've worked hard, and not once have you thrown me a party. You haven't even had a dinner in my honor. But Wayne comes home, the son who spent his inheritance on who knows what, and you throw it, what was he called it again? Oh, yeah, the biggest shindig the tumbleweed's ever seen. Oh, John, hold on a minute. Let me go. Just hear me out, just, just, just for a minute here. John, you're my pride and joy. You've been stuck, you stuck by me and you've been a great help to me and I'm so proud of the man that you've grown up to be. I love you so much and everything I own belongs to you. But Wayne's my son also. He's your brother, <laughs> he's family. And I love him too. And. He's made some bad choices, that's for sure, but he's repented. He's turned back and come home to us. It was like he was dead, and now he's alive. He was lost, and now he's found. John, I, I forgive him, and you should too. Uh, John? Yeah? Well, I already apologized to Paul, but I wanted to say sorry to you too. I treated you something awful. I, I never helped out around here like I should have. And I, I, I'm sorry for what I did, and I just hope you'd please forgive me. I, I promise to be a better brother from now on. Come here, little brother. I'm glad you're back home where you belong. I sure am proud of you, boys. Come on now, we got a party to plan. kept his promises. For the rest of his life, he worked hard and treated others with kindness. Everyone who had known him before were amazed at the change in him. Whenever anyone asked Bovine Bill about it, he would just say, It's amazing what some love and forgiveness will do. And so that's the third story that Jesus told. Three stories. Because the Pharisees, the religious leaders, the people that read scripture and prayed regularly and worked at the church, grumbled because Jesus spent time with tax collectors and sinners. And he taught what the heart of his father was. In the first story with the shepherd, what percentage of people were lost? One percent. Then he told a story about a woman in her house. What percentage was lost? Ten percent. Then you have this young man who takes his inheritance and leaves home. What percentage is lost? 50%. Then you get to the end of the story, and what do you realize? What percentage of people are lost? 100%. The son who stayed on the ranch is just as lost. Does not understand his father's heart. Is filled with anger and bitterness. Unwilling to have his father's heart towards his brother. Just as lost. And when Jesus says there's more rejoicing in heaven over the one that needs to repent than over the 99 that have their act together, it sounds like he's saying, well, most people have their act together before God. That is not what he's saying. By the time you get to the end of the stories, you find out everybody's lost. Everybody is lost. What Jesus was trying to teach, and notice this, what is he trying to do with the Pharisees? He's trying to teach them 
Now, we get on the Pharisees a lot in Scripture, right? Partly because they get things wrong, partly because they're the ones in charge and they should know better. People in responsibility, in, in um, roles of responsibility, have a higher level of accountability. That makes sense. But notice what Jesus is doing. He is telling the Pharisees these three stories so that they can turn back to God the Father. Did you notice that? They aren't just bad guys. Everybody is lost. Jesus takes the time to tell these three stories so that all the Pharisees aren't lost in their attitude towards people who are far from God. Jesus says, my father is the one who goes out and seeks the lost, looks for the coin, waits for the son, greets him. And when you read the story, the son has rehearsed a speech, right? He's rehearsed this speech, and he starts talking to his father. He doesn't make it through his speech before his father hugs him and tells him we're going to have a party. And how much does this younger son deserve this party and this welcome home? Zero. Zero. He doesn't deserve it. And even in the middle of all this blessing, the older son feels only what? Resentment and anger. <laughs> and everybody's lost. And... We started off by talking about a basic question of, you know, how does God feel about me when I wander away? How does God feel towards the lost? Well, what about God's love? So I'm going to read uh, another story about sheep. I know the ladies' Bible study went through Psalm 23. You guys talked a lot about sheep. And, well, and the men, too, as the same day, same study. So Psalm, or I mean, Isaiah 53 says this about Jesus. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we are like sheep gone astray. Just like at the end of Psalm 119, I'm like a sheep that's gone astray. Please look for me. Isaiah 53 says, we are all like sheep, all of us, 100% lost, like sheep gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. At some point in our life, and many points after we even come to faith in Christ, we say exactly what the younger son said. I don't like these rules. I want my freedom. I want to go do what I want, right? We do that, and it, we go astray. And it says here, the Lord laid on him the iniquity or the sin of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth by oppression and judgment. He was taken away. And as for his generation, he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and a rich man in his death. Though he had done no violence, there was no deceit in his mouth. It was the will of the, God, will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. It talks about the Messiah, the one who would come. He is the Lamb of God who takes our sin on himself. It says that he, he died with those who are criminals, but was buried with those who are rich, which is Jesus, who died on a cross next to two criminals, also crucified, but was buried in the tomb of a rich man. That's Jesus. And he, we are all sheep who wander from God. We are. Jesus became a sheep, a lamb, and took our sin on him and was sacrificed for us. So that question, how does God feel about me when I wander away? God loves you. What does the scripture say? While we were yet sinners, Christ did what? Died for us. Did you know that God loved you when you were still far away from him? That Jesus died on a cross for you when you were his enemy? God's love for us is not based on how moral we are. It is not. But we keep getting that wrong especially, I think, sometimes those of us who have come to faith in Christ. We come to faith in Christ, and we understand we're saved by the grace of God, and then we start 
thinking, I need to be better, I need to do this better, I need to be more this way so that God will love me. God already loves you. As a matter of fact, he's not surprised by how often you stray away from where you're supposed to be. He looks for you. God loves you. God's love for you is not based on how wonderful you are. It is not. But we keep trying to do this over and over again in our minds and in our hearts. We try to measure up so God will pay attention to me, measure up so God will bless me, be good enough so God will love me and not forsake me. You will never be good enough for that. You don't need to be. God loves you more than you can understand. Well, what about the lost in the sense of the people who don't know Christ as Savior, the people who are far away from God. What about them? Well, what happened with Jesus is they were drawn to him. Why? Because they were hearing the good news, the gospel, which is that God loves them and is offering forgiveness and love. And that should be our attitude towards those who are far away from God. But sometimes it is not, right? Our attitude is very much like the older son. All we have is criticism and judgment for those who don't measure up. Well, this story tells very clearly. It's just, it's so crystal clear, but we miss it oftentimes. And I'll just say it this way. You better be pretty careful about the judgment that you put on someone else who you feel doesn't measure up to please God. You better be pretty careful about that because how quickly would that come back to you? How much do you plead for God's mercy and love in your life because you need it? Why would you deny that to someone else? As people who follow Jesus, we have to express love and mercy and forgiveness and care and concern for those who are lost. That's the heart of God. And what that means is that is often extremely uncomfortable. That's what that means. But the danger is that we become like the Pharisees, or like the older son, far away from the heart of God. So we're going to have a time of uh, prayer. You're welcome to come up to the altar if you want, or pray where you're at. And um, David's going to lead us in a song, maybe another one. But I have some suggestions of things to pray about. Because these stories work different ways. One is that if you have struggled with feeling that God loves you because you don't measure up, I encourage you to spend some time in prayer and just thank God for how much he has loved you. The cross declares more clearly than anything else God loves you before you did anything <laughs> to, to you know, deserve any sort of love from him. He just loves you, and he knows that you wander away. He knows, and he seeks you. And he, he loves you. And there is no greater motivator for living for God than just understanding how great his love is for you. Grace is the most wonderful motivator. Sometimes people feel like if you talk too much about the grace of God, people will say, oh, well, then you can do whatever you want. When you understand God's grace and mercy to you and how much he loves you, that motivates you to live for him. It does. And you may be in a place today where you you feel like you have been trying to measure up to please God, to get his attention, or that you never will please God, that he never can be pleased with you. And that might be something you need to go in prayer before him this morning. Um, Two other things, maybe, suggestions to pray for. One is there may be someone in your life, family member, uh, someone at work, that you have, unfortunately, your attitude has been that you've written them off. This person is far from God, You almost have said, thank God I'm not like them. God, I'm so thankful I don't struggle with that addiction. God, I'm so thankful I don't have their bad attitude. And you have written them off before God. And Jesus is confronting you this morning on, you don't have my Father's heart for that person. My Father loves that person and wants them to turn and come to him. And you need to stop just writing them off. And then lastly, um, the last story is about a father with children. And some of you are parents, and you have kids who are just like either one of those kids. They're hard-hearted, like the older kid. They're just hard-hearted towards others, judgmental. Or maybe you have a child who has wandered away just to do their own thing, and you pray for them every day, and they have not come back. And 
this is a time where you can go before God and just pray for your children. And I, I pray that the Spirit will lead you in a time of prayer uh, before Him, letting the stories that Jesus told open up your heart in a new way.